Welcome to the 2017-18, can you believe that? Los Alamos Historical Society Lecture Series. We're going to be exploring 100 years plus on the Pajarito Plateau. And we're very excited to have this year's lecture series kicked off with uh, Melissa Bingman, and I'm gonna be introducing Melissa in just a second. First of all, we're going to do a couple of announcements. One, I would first of all like everyone to thank our lecture sponsors that we have this year. We haven't had a lecture sponsor for a few years. In the back, we have Rafi Andonian and Nicole Kleber. Thank you very much. So they are making this evening possible. Also want to introduce, um, hello, <laughs> Linda Boncella, who is our new program chair for the Historical Society. She is the one who's helping to make all the arrangements and uh, work with the uh, the media and work with the speakers and and make the staff's life much easier. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll be hearing from her throughout the year as well. Now, as most of you know, because most of you have been to these lectures before, I usually dress up. But this week, we have a special celebration for the 100th anniversary of the Los Alamos Ranch School. So I'm wearing my jeans and my boots. <laughs> And that is the kickoff tonight. One other announcement before I, I introduce Melissa. I, I hope many of you saw the Los Alamos Daily Post over the last day. The Los Alamos Historical Society has been awarded two national awards from the American Association of State and Local History. These are so hot off the press, they are not yet framed. We received an award for our new exhibits in the museum, and we received a second award, which is very special, for the uh, fabulous and groundbreaking publication, Doomed to Cooperate, by uh, Dr. Sig Hecker, edited by Sig, and, and published by Bathtub Row Press. So congratulations to our volunteers, our staff, our fabulous board of directors, and of course our members. We could not do what we do without you. And if you are not a member of the Historical Society, the opportunities to do that are on the back table. I always have to get my ad in. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Melissa Bingman, Melissa is from our, our part of the woods. She grew up in Scottsdale and went to Arizona State where she got a degree in history and then went to University of South Carolina where she got another degree in history. And uh, she was very interested because that program introduced her to working in museums and there's no better place to work, I can tell you that. Then she spent 11 years roaming around the country working in historic house museums and various museums and really gaining an understanding of what the field is like and then got her PhD at Arizona State. It was while working uh, on her PhD, was it on your PhD that you discovered ranch schools? And that's what we're going to hear about tonight. We love our ranch school. We know how important it is to our community, but it wasn't alone in the, the nation. And so Melissa's going to, to share that with us tonight. And uh, she's got a, a great anecdote that she will tell you about how she got involved in ranch schools and interested in them. And so without further ado, welcome and thank you for being here. Does it work if it goes in? No? I hold it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is such a special treat because you know when you um, you're writing an academic monograph. Your audience is really supposed to be other academics. But I definitely, when writing this, really cared about, would this be something the men I interviewed, the men and women I interviewed, did oral history interviews with? And in the back of my mind, I'd always fantasized about doing a museum exhibit. So this is really, truly a treat to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, so I just want to give an overview of my talk. I thought I'd start by going over some of the research and methodology um, in the book. And I also want to explore with you how ranch schools fit in um, several different approaches to education. And I'd like to suggest that they are both progressive, but they also followed a traditional preparatory school curriculum. And on top of that, they aspire towards character education. And this is really a new direction um, that attempted to address the reduced role of the church in instilling moral instruction. And throughout, I'm going to talk about the importance of the rise of the professional in shaping these schools and also in shaping the future of America. And providing an overview of ranch schools, I'm going to situate them within the broader cultural construct of the interwar period and how I believe them to really be a carryover of several progressive era ideas. And lastly, of course, we have to talk about the West 
and how the, they set up the West as an ideal place for character building of the next generation of youth. So how I found this topic, I was working at the Mesa Southwest Museum, which is sort of ironic because it's a natural history museum, and then it's doubly ironic because I worked in education. I wasn't really allowed back in collections very often. <laughs> And um, I happened to be in the collections area, and this great brochure came by and essentially said, you know, endorsement by Teddy Roosevelt, um, send your boys to the Mesa Ranch School. It'll make real men out of them. And I kind of filed that in my brain. And then when I had to do a seminar paper, I really started delving into the research, which eventually became my dissertation, which eventually became the book. And I started by just trying to find out, you know, what these were. And I just typed in ranch school in the you know, catalog, and a few other schools popped up. But probably the most important thing that I came across was Porter Sargent's handbooks. And I don't know if any of you have heard of Porter Sargent's handbooks. Um, so what was great about these is that he was, he, in the 1928, he has a category of private boarding school for boys, primarily, that were called Western Ranch Schools. So there you have all the listings. So it kind of legitimizes them as a separate category of schools within the broader preparatory school, um, his handbook. What's also great about Porter Sargent, um, and reflects the rise of the professional in giving advice to people, was that he was a commentator and he had opinion on a lot of things. In fact, most of the headmasters um, throughout the country really had strong opinions and advice to give on how you should raise boys of a certain class. Um, so I relied a lot on what they had to say about um, prior education for boys. So I found about 20, um, but there are about six in Arizona that stand out, and that's the Evans School, I think that's on screen, um, Judson School, Southern Arizona School for Boys, the Arizona Desert School, the Palo Verde Ranch School, and the Fresno Ranch School. And all of these, I would argue, are on par with Los Alamos, the Thatcher School, and the Valley School in Wyoming. So the majority of them are really in Arizona. Now the Thatcher School is really the first, and it's in California, and I think it's about 1889. It didn't really start as a ranch school, but by the 20s, they're really promoting what the other ranch schools are promoting for, for his school in California. The Valley School in Wyoming is interesting because it's probably the one that has the most direct link to a dude ranch. So um, to make money in off season, they had the genius idea of starting a school. So boys in Wyoming <laughs> were going to school in um, the snow. So that didn't last too long. Um, so really I think the Arizona schools flourished mainly just because it was better weather. Um, Arizona was also experiencing in the interwar period a burgeoning tourism industry. So a lot of their ranch schools are also really connected to some of the winter resorts that were evolving during that time. Um, there are also two ranch schools for girls that I found. <laughs> and this one is great. It's still, um, the, the building still exists. So another really special thing about Los Alamos is that you have the building preserved um, it's used as a resort, so it's called the um, Hacienda del Sol. It's a resort in Tucson. You can go there and um, stay the night. I did. And I asked them, oh, this would be great to be on the National Register. And they said, oh, that would be great because we can get grant money, but we needed to put electricity in. And I'm like, well, okay, we'll, we'll go there another time. You know, I think a lot of people think you can't update a building if it's on the National Register. So it's not on the National Register. Um, the other ones that are still existing in Arizona are the Orm School, and that's up in Mayer, and it still functions as a school. And then the Southern Arizona School for Boys is actually now the Fresno School. And I think I have a slide towards the end and shows it's still remarkably intact. So I think these schools um, that are in continual use, happen, they, they have the best chance of being preserved. Um, so about that same time um, when I was working on my dissertation, the Judson School for Boys was going to be turn, torn down. It was sold to developers because the land, you, thank you. <laughs> so that's where the Judson School is. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Phoenix, um, but the land is very valuable, and of course, it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> um, so they tore it down, and you know, I asked them if they would save records, and they're like, no, no, we're shredding them all, and you know, I brought an archivist, and um, just didn't work out. But they did say, you should come to our reunion, and you know, see if you can meet people for oral history interviews. 
So fortunately, I did went to the reunion and I looked just for the oldest person in the room, and it turned out, you know, he was a great source. It was David Lincoln, and he was able to refer me to so many other um, people in the area that still lived in Phoenix that attended not only the Judson School but other schools. So I started to see these as part of a, a network. You know, they weren't just isolated. Um, and then in doing further research, I was so lucky that I got to go to the National Association of Independent Schools in Washington, D.C. And I found that most of the ranch schools were members of what was called the Secondary Education Board or the College Entrance Board Exam. So they were really part of this, this bigger network. Um, and why that's so important is because it helped me do more research, but it also helped me answer that question, and I'm sure you've all been asked this too, were they really academic, or how academically rigorous were they? And I can honestly say that yes, they were academically rigorous, and they were legitimate, I'm gonna say fallback schools that had this connection with the select 16 boarding schools in the Northeast, the Atlantic Seaboard, but also the Ivy Leagues. Um, so once I understood this, it actually helped guide my research because I had read an article in the Journal of Arizona History published in the 70s. And she talks about all the people that went to the Evans School and did some phone interviews. And I called the editor and you know, no one knows what happened to her notes or the interviews. Um, so I was just kind of going on what was in the, the journal article. And they said one of the Heinz sons had gone there. And so I went to the Heinz History Center and I, I found some stuff, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, and it said in a biography that he graduated from Choate. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe it was wrong. Maybe I have the wrong Heinz, I don't know. But then when I learned that so many of the students went back and forth between the Select 16 and a ranch school, I went back and I looked and I found the letters he wrote home <laughs> from the Arizona Desert School to his parents. So it was amazing. But I really had to understand that, you know, this might not, have, these ranch school experiences may have only been temporary. Um, so for example, I mean, the number one reason I would say most students went to ranch schools, it was because of health. So it was either their own health or the health of a family member that caused them to relocate to Arizona or the Southwest that precipitated going to a ranch school. But health meant a lot of different things. There was the obvious, you know, sinus infections or you know, breathing problems. Of course, no students with communicable diseases went to could go to ranch schools because they didn't want to get the reputation of being a sanatorium. Um, but Heinz is a really interesting person because he uh, he went to Choate and he spent about two weeks um, away in a hospital in New England, and he talks about going to football games as a participant, but he never talks about getting to do any sports. Um, and I have reason to believe he had polio because he writes about having to have special boots made. He named his horse something that had polio in it and says, oh, my horse and I, or, so I'm not quite sure, but he, was, he, was, he, had, an, he had an illness. Um, and I don't think his parents thought that going to the Southwest would cure polio. Um, but what it did is it gave him an opportunity to do, participate in healthful recreation. So he writes back that he could ride horses, he could go out on his own. So he becomes someone that's, who's active in recreation rather than someone that, who is simply a participant. Um, so health also meant kind of building up your character through masculine traits. So it meant a lot of things. But I will say that's, that's my, I suspect that's the number one reason that most students went to ranch schools. Incidentally, at the National Association for Independent Schools, I called them to get the rights to their archives um, when I, the book was coming out, and they said, we moved, we got rid of all that stuff. And I said, oh no, well, you know, I'm still gonna use it, because at least then I have some notes and some documentation of you know, what existed there, but that's so common. <laughs> Just, we need to move and clean out stuff, and so I'm glad I got there when I did. <laughs> You will go to the next slide. So one of the things that really made the ranch schools um, progressive was that they were largely open air schools. And what open air schools were is they come out of the progressive era 
And most, the earliest ones were 1907, 1908, and they started in, let me see, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, um, Providence, Rhode Island, and I think Boston. So these are all relatively cold places, right? <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So these are largely for urban children living in poorer areas. And um, the idea was if they were to, had tuberculosis, they needed to be in open air environments. They didn't think anything about the temperature. <laughs> but they did um, wear, I think Marshall Field sold Eskimo suits for students who were going to an open air school to wear. Um, and if you contrast that to the previous image, you don't have to go back to the previous image, but <laughs> and you can see really the class difference. So I argue that you know these were considered open air schools. They were just for children who could afford to go out to the Southwest. And um, I thought just for fun, in looking for my ideal, that's not my ideal photograph, that's a photograph, of kids in Eskimo suits going to open air schools, um, I came across at the Library of Congress, the Louise Dunham Goldsberry Collection. And in that, and of course I looked at the Library of Congress for all the ranch schools, and I, I found some stuff, but um, in this collection is a file from New Mexico, and it features Los Alamos. So she had studied it as an example of an open air school, and she wrote letters, I think, to 1,800 places across the country, handwritten letters, for them to send in photographs. So they do have a few photographs, and I, I'm curious if they are in your collection, maybe the photographs were taken here and sent to her, or they're new to you. So next slide. So that's one of them that was in the Louise um, Dunham Goldsberry collection. Not sure if that looks familiar to you. I love this one because it kind of shows that part of the experience was you know, conquering nature and taming wild animals. Does that one look familiar? It's in the book, yeah. But it's just what I <laughs> Next slide. This one's not in the book, it didn't make the cut, but I loved it just because there's a wide open scene. So, uh, new? You've seen that one? Okay, okay. Okay, so this might be new. Not that you need more photographs from what I hear, but it might be nice to see, you know, know that there's others out there. And the next slide. Yeah, and that's from the cover of the book. And I like the cover, but um, I, disclaimer, I do not support kids bringing guns to school. <laughs> All ranch schools did, um, and this is a really important piece of them, and I mentioned that character education, I would say, is, was primary at these schools. And one of the ways to develop boys' character was to instill masculine traits. And of course, there's this fear that the next generation, they're not gonna be able to assume leadership positions because they just don't have the same conditions to be self-made as I did. So with the Heinz family, you know, you see this, um, you know, H.J. Hines starts pushing his jarred condiments, you know, in a push card, and he builds his empire. His son takes over the empire, um, and the grandson, was ex Jack Hines, was expected to do the same thing. So the Heinzes would um, instill a work ethic in them by having them work in the salt mine, you know, <laughs> during the summers, or pick cucumbers at the, one of their cucumber farms. And there's a newspaper ad that talked about how no one knew that um, it was him because he worked just as hard as everyone else even though he didn't have to. So there's this real fear of like, how are we gonna instill in this generation the same character traits that made me a self-made person when they don't really need to work? And plus in the 1920s, they had access to urban luxuries, you know, consumer goods, everything. So there's this real cultural concern. Um, so of course there's many ironies about the Western experience, which was seen as ideal for cultivating character in young boys of a certain class, um, with actual safety. So these schools really walked a fine line between um, proving they were civilized and safe, but rugged enough to instill these character traits. And I don't know if you have any examples of this at Los Alamos, but there, there are three really tragic deaths at, that I know of at three of the Arizona schools. And when I started doing oral history interviews, everyone who went to the Judson School talked about that tragic day when someone was accidentally shot and killed. And I was able to look at the newspaper, and in fact, you know, they were spot on. It really left an impression, as you can imagine. Okay. Let me go back. Sorry, I'm having trouble managing the microphone, my glasses. <laughs> I do need my glasses. <laughs> okay, 
So ranked schools were simultaneously progressive as they adhered to a traditional curriculum of Ivy Leagues and the Select 16, but also embraced character education. The term character education was as loosely defined as progressive education, and its proponents struggled, struggled with the question, if the church is not going to be the primary institution for instilling character, should this be the responsibility of schools and what exactly will it look like? Headmasters and private school educators latched onto this affirming that absolutely it should be the role of private schools because they are responsible for cultivating the next generation of leaders and in essence, the future of our nation. So character education as a movement was difficult to define, so instead, researchers and advice givers created lists of behaviors, traits, and moral codes in an effort to define the outcomes educators should expect. One educational expert lumped manliness, Christian character, loyalty, integrity, courage, nobility, moral culture, piety, virtue, truthfulness, unselfishness, honesty, responsibility, and worthy purpose under the rubric of character. So boys demonstrated character through obedience, cleanliness of life, good habits, purity of thought, acceptance of responsibility, self-control, and self-reliance. And that's the key word. So every ranch school brochure that I have seen emphasizes we are going to cultivate self-reliance. And that's what the Old West can do for you. So in their aim to address the character needs of boys destined to be the next generation of leaders, education and parenting experts focus their criticism on the problem of the rich man's son, inept parenting caused by modern society, and the resultant broken homes. In ranch schools, we see the ideology of the Old West used to instill character traits, most specifically masculinity, to remedy some of the problems that were threatening the future of America. What was profound about Western ranch schools was their ability to sustain the perception of the West as a region of simple living, devoid of urban dangers, retentions, and rampant consumerism, while simultaneously perpetuating one of the most revered of all elite institutions, the private boarding school. So there is this fear of the rich man's son, or I'd say concern over the rich man's son as I described. And parents and grandparents join middle class professional experts in their concern over under and wealth and its consequences. Inheriting large sums of money potentially took away the need to succeed on one's own merits and stifled the cultivation of self-reliance. Second and third generations of the self-made captains of industry did not have the same tests or reason to become self-made, so several came up with their own means of instilling character and appreciation for working one's way up. And here's the quote about John Heights. It says, um, they herald the quote, modesty, common sense, and sterling character of the young Mr. Heights as demonstrated by the fact that he has been here working for several weeks and it is only by accident that the knowledge of his being here has become somewhat known. He worked the same schedule as the other workers in the plant beginning at seven o'clock in the morning and working till 12 o'clock all night at night, if necessary, to get the work done. Those who knew him said that he has his father's and grandfather's common sense and is not afraid of work just because he is a rich man's son and doesn't have to work. So ranch schools took on characteristics parents expected of authentic Western ranch life, including the opportunity for ranch work. Most work conducted by ranch schools was solely for character building rather than for actually running the ranch with a few exceptions. Child science advice givers connected a need for household chores to the decline of child labor in order to cultivate work ethic emphasizing character development rather than a need to contribute to one's family income. Orm school students were required to pitch in with ranch chores that included milking, egg gathering, current picking, washing windows, and maintaining the ranch vehicles and machinery. At the Fresno Ranch School, a group of boys under the guidance of a school electrician learned the skills needed to take responsibility for all the machinery on the ranch. At most ranch schools, however, students completed service projects in the form of capital improvement to school property. Manual training at the Judson School consisted of learning the craft of woodworking in the school shop that was equipped with a power sander, jigsaw, and bandsaw. In 1931, boys at the Judson School completed three construction projects. They completed a horseback riding trail in Mummy Mountain and built two adobe buildings. Similarly, the students at the Arizona Desert School built a chapel by hauling rocks to make an altar, pulpit, and seats. Daily chores consisted of carrying water to the chapel bird bath, picking rocks off the polo field, weeding the front yard garden, and grooming horses. 
and then here's a, you, most of you are probably are familiar with Charles Pierce's memoir. Um, he referred to the acquired afternoon of community work as, quote, humbling work calculated to instill community spirit and to quash anything resembling a superiority complex. complex. Um, so aside from the Orm School and the young electricians at the Fresno Ranch, again, it, the work of ranch school students really did not supplement the labor force necessary to run the school and ranching operations. Um, nationally and at Southwestern Ranch Schools, servants took care of laundry, cleaned rooms, and cleaned up after meals. Cowboys and ranch hands performed most of the dirty work of caring for horses, livestock, and crops. By the turn of the century, the Imagine West had many qualities that made it ideal proving ground for American youth. Western ranch schools became a valued resource for the education of the elite because in the American mind, the West lacked the hindrances of inherited privilege and other cultural and social restraints that inhibited youth from becoming self-made. Its rugged environment forced adolescents to prove themselves and cowboys and ranchers served as role models of self-made individuals. The absence of urban conveniences and unwholesome leisure activities ensured that they would not succumb to indolence that plagued children of privilege. Ironically, Western boosters lured wealthy Easterners to their communities by offering the very elite institutions they were accustomed to, while at the same time creating perception of the West as a place where constraints of class boundaries and family lineages could be overcome. Now, one of the um, other ironies of ranch schools um, is the consumerism aspect. So they're supposed to be devoid of consumerism, but it didn't quite work that way. Um, for one thing, these were the most expensive of all private schools during this time. I, like, twice as much, sometimes three times as much. And then, of course, there's the money you have to spend in getting a horse, because you can't be Western without a horse. <laughs> So the region itself became a consumable experience, available only to the very wealthy who could afford tuition fees, a horse, and the plethora of Western accoutrements needed to truly remake oneself. As Western tourists, students were also collectors. One Arizona Desert School alumni I met in Rhode Island continues to hold on to his trusty lasso. A Valley Ranch School student's Wyoming trophies include Navajo rugs, an Indian grinding stone, and a sun-bleached horse skull. So in order to participate in all the West had to offer, children pressured parents to purchase items necessary for ranch life. At the Evans School, each student bought his own horse and gear. Incidentals such as horseshoeing and camping cost an average of $32 a week extra. In a letter to his parents, Jack Hines enclosed his Fox Chapel bill for $7.95 and then relayed, quote, he bought a pair of cheap but very strong and well-made boots for $15.75. I had to get them in a hurry because I went camping this weekend. I believe one said that my boots might be a Christmas present. I would indeed appreciate that deeply in my present financial slump, as it were. The rest of my stuff, bridal $5, bit $3.50, brush and comb $1.50, made a total of $24, which I can afford okay. A saddle is being charged to me for $40. I love the use of the passive voice on that one. He then thanked his parents for mailing him his gun with an added point, more, expensive for sh more expenses for shells. In a postscript line, he suggested his parents give him a little financial support in the camera line. It would be best to buy one here, out here, I figure. It would be a really good thing to have, as there are lots of opportunities to take interesting pictures out here. So parents continued to provide children with extravagant gifts, much to the consternation of at least one headmaster, as reflected in an incident that occurred on Christmas Day in 1930 at the Arizona Desert School. And this is the headmaster, Matt Baird. So reflecting on his experience as a headmaster, um, he described the students who attended the Arizona Desert School as the sons of wealthy families of Long Island, the main line of Philadelphia, and the lakeshore of Chicago. They were young, third grade through ninth, who led sheltered lives. Certainly they had never known hunger, and what they asked for they expected to receive, a natural and blameless expectation of their age and background. Baird wrote a letter to their parents requesting that they refrain from sending lavish Christmas gifts because of the economic crisis in the local community. Even so, families sent an extraordinary array of gifts, including ping pong tables, a billiard table, sports equipment, 1.3 radios per boy, and seven sets of electric trains and track. Disappointed in the boys' lack of enthusiasm for donating duplicate items to a local orphanage, Baird initiated a school service project to construct a chapel for the Catholic and Protestant orphanages of Tucson. In future years, the students at the Arizona Desert School entertain boys from St. Joseph's Orphanage and the Arizona Children's Home. So you can see the irony is trying to be anti-consumerism, but 
it was an expensive experience that did require a lot of things that you had to purchase. I think in one of the brochures it said, you know, everyone needs to wear Western tire, here's what's appropriate, and it's really best that you buy it out here in the West. Don't buy it in the East Coast. So it kind of lined the pockets of everyone affiliated with providing, providing these accoutrements. So Range Schools promised to make men out of boys by immersing them in the masculine environment of the Old West and instilling the character traits associated with the gentleman cowboy. Headmasters felt that organized religion and the home had failed boys in their ability to provide moral instruction and responded by focusing on the development of Christian character through masculine virtues in these crucial years when boys prepared for college. In the interwar period, masculinity and character were intricately linked and in many cases they were one and the same. The region imagined as the American West was well equipped to cultivate masculinity because there's no place as consistently referred to uh, identify it with maleness. Overnight camping trips, Spartan living, and physical tests enabled boys to prove their manhood, bravery, and self-reliance as they prepared for their future roles as leaders and citizens. By allowing boys to experience a form of constructed savagery through hunting, using firearms, and roughing it in the great outdoors, they relived the evolution of, the American, of American civilization by reenacting experiences of pioneers. As a result, at ranch schools, headmasters and boys accepted a curious blend of civilized Christian virtue and savagery as an ideal means of character development. One Judson School student aptly conveyed this blending of manners and ruggedness and the value of his ranch school experience in a fictitious letter to a potential parent. This school would be the place for that offspring of yours. It would make a man out of him for sure. By the end of their education, has included everything from being real cowboys to holding teacups. Through an acceptance of masculinity as equal to moral virtue, ranch schools transform the popular conception of the West into moral space. So the most important character attribute of the West was the ability to develop self-reliance. This term is used frequently in describing both the spirit of the West and to define those traits that made men masculine. Literature generated by ranch schools referenced character education within the context of the mythic West and especially highlighted self-reliance. So boys understood and appreciated the degree of freedom permitted at ranch schools and often compared ranch schools to counterparts on the Atlantic seaboard. In reflecting on the 1923 school year, one Evans student wrote that the school was unique because instead of simply preparing for college, Evans was a preparatory school for life. His main example of this distinction was that boys are encouraged to go off for weekends instead of being discouraged or forbidden. This blessing was the result of two happy circumstances, according to the author, the splendid opportunities for camping in the mountains surrounding the school, and the fact that there is little or no trouble to get into. So again, he's referring to that at the select 16 schools, kids were not permitted to go into the city. That's when they would get into trouble. <laughs> So permission of the director was required, but after it's secured, the fellows concerned are at liberty to plan and execute the undertaking as they will. Overnight camping trips in the Great Southwest were ideal for cultivating self-reliance among city weird boys. According to one Judson student, camping trips are among the most desirable and the most enjoyable experiences in a boy's life. There's something about eating food cooked over an open fire, stretching out on a bedroll under the stars, and meeting nature face to face that makes a boy more of a man. The environment itself was still mysterious and daunting when compared to the New England and Midwestern landscape of boys' homes. Sparsely populated and somewhat barren, the natural landscape of New Mexico and Arizona could be intimidating, especially for novices. Boys as young as 12 years of age went horseback camping in groups of two or three and often learned by trial and error. Shoulder responsibility for one's own mistakes was an important character building lesson that was conveyed to Rally Valley Ranch School students by Headmaster Jarvie when he lectured, it was human to make a mistake, but criminal to repeat it. According to a March 193 edition of the Cactus Needle published by the Evans School, the success of the weekend camping trips was dependent entirely on the boys, as Master joins them only at their invitation. If the boy who is engineering the trip is unfortunate enough to take 10 pounds of bologna and forget the bread and matches, well, the chances are that he will never make that mistake again. So hunting trips at boys' ranch schools demonstrated a primitive aspect of masculine virtue based on restrained violence.
From showdowns at the OK Corral to the Indian Wars of the 19th century, the history of the West was violent. Even activities such as working with cattle add an element of masculine violence to boys and some girls' ranch school experience. Environmentalist Edward Abbey commented on the brutal nature of range and livestock industry. Anyone who's taken part in gathering, roping, branding, dehorning, castrating, ear notching, or winching a calf from its mother knows how mean and tough and brutal it can be. So the practice of trapping at the Valley School in Wyoming was almost too gruesome for Philip Cummings to bear. And Philip Cummings was a headmaster who left a diary, his memoir, so I have a nice chapter from him on his experience, his one-year experience as a headmaster there. So he was assigned to make sure the students visited their traps every day to, quote, relieve the suffering. Older boys who attended the Valley School trapped muskrat and mink, sometimes using pelts to line their coats. In his journal, In his journal, Cummings recognized a natural affinity for hunting among boys while pointing out his opinion of the savagery of it all. The boys did not sell the furs or need them, quote, but he has the, that lust after the wild that seems a part of the adolescent nature of the normal boy. The boys proving of cunning and superiority, his proof of power over animals, his vent to a cruel strain which proves that man for all his spirituality can so easily slip into portraying that of an animal. So several months later he describes um, coming to to check his traps and he said, much to my relief, there was no carnage in those steel instruments of torture. So in conclusion, um, adopting wholeheartedly all aspects of the West was really not an option. And ranch schools constantly had to balance the ideals of the cowboy and his lawlessness, rugged environment, and violence of the West with an understanding of boys' future role as leaders. So as they immersed students in a constructed version of the mythic West, they also had to convince parents their schools were civilized and safe. Ranch schools resurrected certain aspects of the Old West, the agrarian paradise that had forged the American spirit of individualism and democracy that was anti-modern, anti-urban, and anti-technological for the dual purpose of preparing boys for college and the responsibilities of masculine citizenship. At the same time, promotional literature assured parents that the Southwest was both civilized and safe by boasting proximity to urban conveniences. The result was that ranch school students experienced a rugged yet protected version of the Old West through geographic isolation, restricted encounters with indigenous cultures, and overnight camping trips and other ranch activity intended to cultivate self-reliance. Okay, go to the next slide. So I do want to mention, talk about, and I'm sure this is the same at Rose Island, just the primary importance of the horse in this experience. And a lot of the, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the supreme importance of the horse is part of the ranch school experience. And so some of the yearbooks will reflect, um, you know, the, they would say quirky things in the 20s and 30s, nicknames, um, and maybe girlfriends they had. Well, at the ranch schools, the rela main relationship was really with their horse. So they had all their horses' name listed, how much they loved their horses, but it was really the primary, um, primary means of being Western. So at first when I saw there were so many, they played polo. In fact, one of the ways I define the um, stronger Arizona ranch schools is by the traditional method of sports, who played who in sports. So they did have this network of playing polo against each other. And when I first saw these photos or understood they played polo, I'm envisioning just dust, clouds everywhere. You know, it's dusty in Arizona. Um, but for one, it demonstrates the primary supreme um, emphasis placed on the horse, but also the idea that this is a cultivated activity that you would also play on the East Coast. And I don't know if any of you have heard of British remittance men. Well, they were the second generation of a lot of um, English um, nobility. And as a second son, they could not inherit the title, so they were given a chunk of money. And a lot of them came out west, and that's how polo got introduced to the west. So you'll actually see it in Wyoming. Um, someone today at the Shippo office was telling me it was very prevalent in New Mexico, um, but definitely in Arizona. Next slide. 
So this is the photo of the school that it still exists and is operated as a school. Um, and you can see, I think it's remarkable how they preserved it. But again, I, I said the same thing. You, you should, we should get this on the National Register. But we have to run it as a school, so we have to have electricity. And it's like, well, well, we'll deal with that another time. So it's, it's one, you know, this is the only ranch school that's actually on the National Register. So that's something, very, um, something to be very proud of. And I thought I wouldn't do too much formal presentation because I bet you have some questions for me. So I would love to open up for, for more conversation. Yes. Uh, scout, Boy Scouting was a, was a really important part of my, the curriculum and everything here. Um, did other schools adopt Boy Scouting? No, no, no. So that's a really unique aspect of Los Alamos Ranch School. And my guess is it's just one of those things that was of interest to the founder of the school and the headmaster, but also the, the Boy Scouts were um, kind of increasing in popularity or just getting started in the 19-teens. Um, so that by the 1920s, maybe that just wasn't something that the other schools adopted, but that's something really unique to Los Alamos. Yes? And you talk about the ranch schools between the two wars. What happened to the ranch schools at the Second World War? Yeah, a lot of different things. In fact, we were discussing that um, in um, Austin, you know, what happened to the ranch schools. And, you know, I did start, I wasn't sure I was going to stop in the interwar period, but they do pretty much go away. And um, I'm speculating, but some of the reasons I think are that, well, the very practical reason is a lot of the men um, went off to war, so they had difficulty running the schools. Um, they were very expensive. I think that had a factor. I think after World War II, um, private school education became a little bit more democratized. Um, so a few schools that did remain, they started really dealing with global issues, you know, more service-oriented um, um, endeavors, whereas the ranch schools, they networked among each other, but they were isolated from the communities. Um, I don't know, we kind of speculate with some other ideas of why they went away. But I think the other reason is that just going out west wasn't special anymore. People could drive in a car, so it wasn't as isolated as it was. Given that these were rich families, did the uh, Depression not really impact them much? Yeah, that's a good question. What I've seen is no. I do have an account from one man who said that's the reason he went to a ranch school because his parents were so concerned about him seeing the poverty in Chicago, they wanted to remove him from that urban environment. It was just, I guess, too, they thought it was too much for you know, a nine-year-old to be exposed to. And then um, at most of the ranch schools, I don't know what at Los Alamos, if there were these chapel services. So what these, they, they weren't religious, they were, um, sectarian, but they were kind of these moral lessons, I think. And one of them at the Valley School was about the Depression and what is the role of someone in a leadership position who has money to this economic crisis. So again, you see this trying to make them more sensitive, more responsible leaders. But it seems like they were fine during the Depression. That's a really good question that um, you might be able to better answer too, because you've been doing biographies on so many people. Um, he asked, "Is there any is there any evidence or any studies that you know this experience really did help them in leadership roles in World War II and after?" Um, so I can only go by oral history interviews that I've done, and most of them seem to have done really well. Most men that went to ranch schools were in World War II. Um, so I've had some interviews that it goes way <laughs> way beyond ranch schools talking about. World War II. Um, I, think, I think it's Charles Pierce's um, memoirs, and he talks about how the experience at Los Alamos really helped him get through um, being overseas in World War II. Peter Decker, you say? Um, 
Yes and no. <laughs> so in Arizona, most of the ranch schools were run by a husband and wife team, but they had very specific roles. <laughs> so the uh, mother was kind of the civilizer, so just like kind of what you envision of the Old West, so civilizing the frontier. Like Mrs. Orm would always remember the boys' birthdays or kind of do the nice things. But um, you know, at the Judson School, Mrs. Judson was responsible for all the menu planning. So in Arizona, they tend to be more of a team. However, that's something interesting about the advice givers. Um, they're talking about how you should rear your children. And the, the worst thing you could do is basically let your son be raised by his mother. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. I mean, they really were hard on mothers. And um, I did find a dissertation written in 1940 by um, one of the headmasters who wrote about the problems of ranch school students. And that was the big one, that they had been petted and spoiled by their mothers at home Thank goodness they're away from them. So even Thatcher talked about, um, you know, like, soon as I let a boy come into school, here comes his mother following and setting up camp like, you know, Mary's little lamb. <laughs> they're very insulting, but they really felt that. Like, um, kids that were raised by servants, that was a lot of problem. Absentee parentism was a big problem, or advice givers felt it was a big problem, but also just overcoddling by mothers, um, so really kind of harsh. Yeah. So since leadership was so emphasized, is there any list of names of people who took significant <coughs> leadership roles, like in politics, or is there any famous people that we would know right off the bat, or is it? Um, you know what's hard to say about that is most of the students were already in line for positions to take over the family business. So who can say if it was the ranch school? So like the children, the Upton children, um, inherited the Whirlpool um, dynasty. And then the sons um, of the Dalzells for Fostery Glass. They go back to West Virginia and they work in their family's business. So a lot of these went back to their family business, which they probably would have anyway. Um, there are a lot of lists of like the governor of Maine or from the Arizona Desert School. Um, so several did go into politics. But again, I'm not quite sure that they were destined for those kind of roles anyway. Yeah. What about girls' schools? Well, they're interesting because um, so I wasn't quite sure how to even address them in my research because they are just like the boys' schools in that they have this Western emphasis. And I did an oral history interview with one woman and she sat down and said, I'm gonna put the record straight. This was not a finishing school, it was an academically rigorous ranch school and we did ranch activities and we learned to ride horses and um, she was very proud of that. Now the Jokaki School in um, Phoenix, so the Phoenix area is a little different because it's really coming out of this tourism industry. So I think the, the daughter and her husband of the owners of the Jokaki Inn, they started a ranch school for girls because so many winter visitors were coming there and spending the entire winter and decided it was better to bring their kids with them if there was a school rather than putting them in boarding school in the east. Um, I think Mr. Judson started a school for girls um, that had a brief, he just wasn't as good at um, running a girl's school as he was at running a boy's school. So I think that that lasted for about a year and he had two boys and a girl. So basically his daughter just went to the Judson school with all the boys, that's just how it worked out. Uh, so there, there was a lot of emphasis on these schools for help. Uh, do you have any statistics on, like I know here at the ranch school, a lot of them came here because of asthma and uh, things like that. I don't think TV, but you know, they have to be uncommunicable by the time they came here. But I've noticed in my research, research that a lot of these gentlemen live till their 80s and 90s. It's no different kind of from the regular population. And did that, as Connell would say here, you know, a few years to help them get their health straightened out so that they could then later be the leaders you wanted or good in school later. So are there statistics about how that health aspect actually did or didn't work? Unfortunately, not that I've seen, um, but I do think that was the idea that that's that kind of back and forth. It was a temporary thing, usually, to come to a ranch school. Um, they were destined to go back. I mean, some people 
definitely stayed. Um, but that's probably the best proof they lived into their 80s. So I, I can't say definitively, or I've not seen a study on that, like if it really worked. Oh, yes. Uh, you, have, you left the impression that these students basically came east from Mississippi. Uh, did any of them come from, for example, the West Coast or Canada or even other countries like Europe or Mexico? I've not seen from other countries, but there were some that came from the West. and. So Phoenix, is, again, is interesting because it was kind of ripe in the 20s for development and families to come out there and establish a business. So there were people who had moved for Arizona for a different reason, but they needed a place for their kids to go to school because it just was tradition at that time for a lot of families, you do go to a private boarding school and then you do go to an Ivy League school. So I think families were appreciative that instead of having to ship their, you know, student or leave them back east or in the Great Lakes region that they were able to, they had schools that they could go to. And it wasn't that the public schools were bad by any stretch of the imagination. It was just these were different and that they were designed to get them in this social network. One thing I did find were a lot of letters from headmasters to headmasters of the Select 16 boarding school giving letters of recommendation and vice versa. So they really do seem to have this kind of reciprocal relationship. Um, I don't know about like the Ivy Leagues, but definitely they were on par. So students did go back and forth between them. And I think the idea was they only went out there for a, maybe a couple of years to a ranch school. I mean, some graduated from there. Um, the other thing is, and I wish I had explored this more in my research, is the social networking aspect. So all of these rare schools had headmasters or um, the, the owner had still had their connections with Ivy Leagues and other well-known boarding schools. So I think on their recommendation alone, so the Thatcher School, for example, I mean, that was designed to get kids into Yale. And the majority of their graduates did go to Yale, but he was from Yale. Um, he just wanted to move out to California. And, he decided, well, what the heck, I'll start a, I'll start a ranch school. So social networks are, are key. Um, I think in Pittsburgh, there's a school in Arizona that really had those Pittsburgh connections. I know most of the schools had an office in New York and in Chicago to recruit from. So this summer, the headmaster spent a lot of time going around meeting families and recruiting from the um, Atlantic Seaboard and the Great Lakes region. And I think you said Los Alamos had an office in Chicago, or you were going up to Chicago because that's. Okay, okay. A few key families. Yes. You know, that no. they knew that kept going. I'm also going to say, besides the West Coast, which they did do, there's a lot of oil men that sent their kids here from Oklahoma, Texas, and like that through the West. Uh huh. Oil men would probably have enough money. <laughs> They're supposed to replace the standard school year. So there were some that were summer camps, but like in the Valley School example, their dude ranch season was in the summer. So it was the traditional school year is when they decided to open ranch school to keep income coming in. But I think the school year, was it seems really short to me. Like I wanna say it was October through April. Um, it was a really short, and I don't know if, the, I do not know if that was traditional for all preparatory schools are just the ranch schools. Because again, um, in Arizona, a lot of it, they really did kind of coincide with the resort season. So they were together, but like Valley School, they wanted them opposite. Yes? So the head of the Los Alamos Ranch School, AJ Hall, wrote tons of letters to the parents. And they were like extremely well-written letters. And they had a sense of uh, sort of dailiness to them, which kind of surprised mm -hmm. me. I don't know how many letters he wrote, but it seemed like a lot. Do you 
you see that same sort of thing with other ranch schools? No, it sounds like you have a treasure trove here that I wish I had gotten my hands on before I wrote the book. But no, I've not found anything like that. It's the letters I've seen are more about um, recommending a student to another headmaster, or again, the, the letters that I've seen from kids to their parents, and they usually are about, please send more money. I need a, another gun. <laughs> How do the numbers of women's schools compared to the boys? I'm assuming that there are fewer? Far fewer, far fewer. Those are the only two examples that I know of. I did, I did, and I consider that more of just a traditional preparatory, preparatory school rather than a ranch school. Um, but what's interesting is, again, there, there's kind of these social networks, and the boys from the ranch schools would often have um, social events with the girls from the other ranch schools and Brownmore. Mm -hmm. I have a big tub of research that I'll, I'll see if I can go through because I photocopied everything just to, yeah. Yes. Gord Vidal was a notoriously, famously banned Nash that was on our <laughs> curriculum and staff. Um, can the other schools point to you know, famous failures or successes? Or <laughs> Well, I do know of one gentleman, it was actually Nicholas Brown, who went to, when I was in Rhode Island, I met him and I was talking about my research, he said, I went to one of those, and, um, but he went during World War II, um, they had found a spot in his lung, and he, they were fearful that Rhode Island Newport would get blown up, so he got shipped out to the desert, and he's one, he did not enjoy it, he said, I was a yachts person, you know, I liked the ocean, I did not like horses, and you know, I was kind of chubby, and they kept telling me how to lose weight, and you know, he, he did not enjoy it. So I think, you know, the, the students that loved it, loved it. I think you said that about Gore Vidal, and the students that didn't were just, uh, take me back to the ocean, or take me back where I'm from. You know, I don't know for certain, and I've never, I looked that up in Porter Sargent's handbook, because some, he asked me, if, were there um, schools that were similar to ranch schools that were C-oriented? And I didn't see any in Porter Sargent's handbook, but someone did tell me about them, but I've never followed up on research, that they were called ship schools, and they would go out on ships, but hearsay is the extent of my knowledge. I mean, what a fascinating topic. That could be someone's next research topic. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, someone's next research topic, but probably not mine. So, <laughs> But thank you so much. This has been great. And again, I appreciate learning about all your knowledge and all your resources. Thank you. So I neglected to mention that uh, Melissa is a professor at the University of West Virginia where she is head of the public history department. And so John Hunter, that many of us know down at Las Cruces, is, is her, her counterpart and, and teaching many young people today to go out and, and share our history, which is wonderful. She does have a book that she has written, many of you may have seen. We do have it available. It's called Prep School Cowboys, and uh, these are our boys on the front. And so she will be doing a book signing. Just a couple of other quick announcements. Our next lecture is not going to be on the second Tuesday of the month. It's going to be on the second Thursday of the month. And we are very excited to be having the number one best-selling author in the Los Alamos History Museum, Jeanette Conant, 
Uh, she's going to be here and she has a new biography out. It just came out today on her grandfather, uh, James Conant. It is fabulous. I'm about halfway through it and just a great, great book. And I think you will all be very excited about that. So that's going to be on October 12th here at 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll go ahead and let Melissa go to the back so that she can sign books and Todd will have them back there for you. And thank you for being here. <laughs>